And so we begin today a different section in the same chapter. Uh, Stephen is uh, helping his family uh, with his scholarship money uh, because his family is having a financial distress. So here is a description of Stephen uh, taking his parents uh, for a lunch and uh, uh, the narration goes like this. For a swift season of merrymaking, the money of his prizes ran through Stephen's fingers. Great parcels of groceries and delicacies and dried fruits arrived from the city. Every day he drew up a bill of fare for the family and every night led a party of three or four to the theatre to see Ingomar or the Lady of Lyon. Uh, thus, uh, he was uh, using his prize money not only for necessities but also for luxuries like uh, going to the theater with his uh, brothers and sisters and so on. So he thinks whether he can really help his family in this manner uh, because the prize money is going to run out soon. Uh, therefore, one may say that it is a kind of futile attempt. How foolish his aim had been. He had tried to build a breakwater of order and elegance against the sordid tide of life without him and to dam up by rules of conduct and active interest and new filial relations the powerful recurrence of the tides within him. So the tide of life or the demands that life made, uh, made upon him uh, is described as sordid sordid tide of life and uh, that hurts his aesthetic sensibility uh, the poverty the demands and uh, the futile attempts to solve these problems so he is trying to help the family and bring some kind of an order and elegance uh, which he gradually feels uh, impossible from without as from within the water had flowed over his barriers their tides began once more to jostle fiercely above the crumbled moan. So the uh, tide cannot be checked in control and it seems to flood him with uh, its demands. He saw clearly too his own futile isolation. He had not gone one step nearer the lives he had sought to approach nor bridged the restless shame and rancor that divided him from mother and brother and sister. His attempt to help the family does not bring him any closer to the family. He remains isolated in the family as well. He felt that he was hardly of the one blood with them, but stood to them rather in the mystical kinship of foster age, foster child and foster brother. So here is an admission that uh, it is sometimes futile to uh, build bridges uh, where uh, people do not understand you. And therefore Stephen did not feel that he was a genuine part of the family but as if he was a kind of a foster child and, and uh, the family only adopted him and he was trying to help uh, his adopted family. He uh, is in a thoughtful mood and uh, he uh, passes from one emotion to another. His blood was in revolt. He wandered up and down the dark slimy streets, peering into the gloom of lanes and doorways, listening eagerly for any sound. He moaned to himself like some baffled prowling beast. He wanted to sin with another of his kind, to force another being to sin with him and to exalt with her in sin. So in this chapter we see that Stephen is more and more inclined to fulfill his instincts and the uh, libido uh, uh, grows stronger and stronger. So Stephen has reached an age, uh, his adolescence, uh, his uh, youth, uh, when the libido is the strongest and therefore uh, he feels that uh, he must venture out. He must somehow fulfill this uh, desire. 
and uh, this chapter will end with uh, uh, Stephen attempting to fulfill this desire by going to the prostitute quarters uh, which in Dublin was called the Jewish quarters and therefore uh, he uh, imagined himself like a prowling beast so it is the animal instinct in him which uh, rises uh, and becomes stronger and stronger. But uh, his uh, Roman Catholic education has taught him that uh, sexual activity is uh, sinful and therefore an acute sense of guilt, an acute sense of sin also pervades him. Uh, and uh, he thinks that he wanted to sin with another of his kind. Uh, the, the use of the word kind says that it is an entirely natural act, the same kind that is uh, the, uh, the uh, interest between, the, the attraction between male and female of the same species. Uh, he moaned to himself like some baffled prowling beast. Uh, he felt some dark presence moving irresistibly upon him from the darkness, a presence subtle and murmurous and a flood filling him wholly with itself. Its murmur besieged his ears like the murmur of some multitude in sleep. Its subtle streams penetrated his being. So the uh, power of the instinctive desire, the power of the desire on him is uh, imagined like, like a great noise, like a tumult uh, breaking upon him. Uh, which began as a murmur and then develops as a tumult. And uh, this presence uh, is a reference or an allusion to the, the uh, power, the uh, instinct which uh, drives him at the moment. Uh, for this, uh, psychologists use the word drive. Uh, so something which drives one, leads one, forces one and uh, Stephen uh, imagines uh, that power to be uh, male or masculine and his soul, uh, because soul is imagined ordinarily to be female, so here uh, we have the uh, language of penetration. Its subtle streams penetrated his being. It is a metaphorical expression of the sexual act. And uh, this, we may say, is the penetration of the uh, female soul by lust. Uh, then he goes to the Jewish quarters and uh, Joyce gives very uh, realistic description of the Jewish quarters and people calling out to one another, uh, the clients looking up uh, towards the windows of the uh, buildings from uh, which the prostitutes uh, look down and they exchange greetings. Good night, Willie dear, and so on. Uh, then Stephen uh, goes to a prostitute and of course uh, she is uh, much older than Stephen because Stephen is only an adolescent. And in this encounter with the prostitute, we see that uh, Stephen remains mostly passive uh, because he hardly knows what to do and all the in initiatives are taken by the prostitute. Her room was warm and lightsome. A huge doll sat with her legs apart in the copious easy chair beside the bed. He tried to bid his tongue speak that he might seem at ease watching her as she undid her gown, noting the proud conscious movements of her perfumed head. As he stood silent in the middle of the room, she came over to him and embraced him gaily and gravely. Her round arms held him firmly to her, and he seeing her face lifted to him in serious calm, and feeling the warm calm rise and fall over breast, all but burst into hysterical weeping. Tears of joy and relief shone in his delighted eyes and his lips parted though they would not speak. So we see that uh, Stephen is uh, flooded with emotion and uh, he starts weeping as if you know some 
long repressed desire has suddenly uh, found an uh, outburst or a sudden uh, uh, experience. So the uh, experience of the embrace and, and later the kiss uh, by the prostitute is, uh, it creates a very strong impression upon Stephen. She passed her tinkling hand through his hair, calling him a little rascal. Give me a kiss, she said. His lips would not bend to kiss her. He wanted to be held firmly in her arms, to be caressed slowly, slowly, slowly. In her arms he felt that he had suddenly become strong and fearless and sure of himself, but his lips would not bend to kiss her. So why can't he kiss her? Because of his inhibition. Uh, his Roman Catholic training, uh, you know, kind of stops him from engaging in any uh, kind of sexual act. Here we see the uh, prostitute uh, in a nursing role. She is a motherly figure to Stephen and she is more uh, here uh, in a mother-like image. So in Stephen's psyche, the uh, mother image is substituted by the whore of the prostitute. With a sudden movement she bowed his head and joined her lips to his, and he read the meaning of her movements in her frank uplifted eyes. It was too much for him. He closed his eyes, surrendering himself to her body and mind, conscious of nothing in the world but the dark pressure of her softly parting lips. They pressed upon his brain as upon his lips as though they were the vehicle of a vague speech. And between them he felt an unknown and timid pressure, darker than the soon of sin, softer than sound or odor. Uh, this uh, moment is a moment of epiphany for Stephen. So as uh, we will discuss later, the, the uh, idea of epiphany which uh, Stephen uses, uh, which Joyce uses frequently in this novel, so the moment of epiphany is the moment of a revelation when you experience something ordinary and yet you extract some extraordinary meaning from, from it. What is significant is that here Stephen cannot uh, formulate an expression. He cannot say anything. Uh, because the whole experience is so overwhelming for him that uh, his language uh, is baffled and he, he can't express through language, which means that he has not yet mastered this experience. So only when one is able to uh, master an experience, then one is able to express it through language. In Laconian terms, uh, the uh, realm of language is the uh, uh, symbolic realm. Uh, when we learn to uh, give symbolic expression to our experience. Uh, the chapter ends with this nursing image. Now, as I told you that uh, there is a pattern in this novel and, and in every chapter uh, there is a crisis which uh, develops at the beginning of the novel and this crisis is resolved at the end of the novel. And here this uh, crisis of Stephen's adolescence uh, when he felt uh, more and more alienated from everybody, from friends, from family and uh, he was also uh, beleaguered by the sexual drives and a, a crisis develops and this crisis is resolved at the end of the chapter through the uh, sexual experience uh, that Stephen uh, encounters with this prostitute and uh, the chapter ends with a nursing image. So uh, this uh, mother image is according to Jung uh, the mother archetype. So this archetypal uh, use of the mother image uh, helps to uh, continue, helps to uh, uh, connect the no connect the chapters through a kind of thread or a thread of continuity.
well uh, this is a new experience for him okay so he never had any kind of sexual experience but uh, because of his sex drive he he feels the urge of going to a prostitute and there the uh, experience that the prostitute gives him of uh, embracing kissing and so on uh, this experience is completely new for him and he could not master this experience uh, the prostitute being much older than him uh, she is kind of affectionate towards uh, this uh, you know uh, boy and uh, calls him the little rascal and so on therefore she appears here as a mother image she is more uh, kind of nurturing uh, the boy nurse is in a nursing uh, situation uh, or a nursing position rather than uh, you know uh, having a, a true encounter and and therefore uh, in this description we have both the mother image or the nursing image the which is uh, according to jung the mother archetype uh, which is a basic uh, Uh, experience or archetypal uh, experience in our collective unconscious okay. and uh, this is uh, significant for uh, our psychic growth so we we uh, look for being nursed by our mother figures or uh, you know uh, elderly women and uh, the point here is that uh, for stephen it is some kind of a novel experience which he has not yet mastered and therefore he cannot express through language he cannot say anything and secondly it provides a momentary uh, resolution to the crisis uh, that was developing in him is it clear yes sir thank you sir Okay. Uh, anybody else has any question? Okay, then we move on to the next chapter, chapter three. Now I told you that in this novel we find that uh, erotic experience is alternated with food imagery, or sometimes substituted by food imagery, uh, because. Uh, taking of food is also uh, according to psychologists a kind of an erotic act at the beginning of the next chapter we see uh, the sweet december dusk had come tumbling clownishly after its dull day and as he stood through the dull square of the window of the school room he felt his belly crave for its food he hoped there would be stew for dinner turnips and carrots and bruised potatoes and fat mutton pieces to be ladled out in thick peppered flour flattened sauce flour fattened sauce stuff it into you his belly counseled him okay so uh, the why food is a uh, uh, substitution for uh, erotic experience because uh, it is also extremely sensual the uh, different food items they offer uh, satisfaction to our uh, different uh, sensations you know uh, taste touch uh, smell and so on and so forth and uh, therefore they are very strong stimuli uh, like sexual stimuli the the, the uh, food uh, items they they also attract one uh, very strongly and uh, like sexual uh, activity uh, food is also or taking food is also a physical activity then we see uh, further description of the jewish quarters uh, prostitutes uh, greeting their clients and uh, uh, there's this dialogue hello berti any good in your mind is that you pigeon number 10 fresh nelly is waiting on you good night husband coming in to have a short time 
So this is the kind of conversation that goes on between prostitutes and their clients. And uh, Joyce represents it very realistically. Uh, and therefore, as I told you that uh, two kinds of styles alternate in this novel. Uh, just before this, at the end of the previous chapter, we saw the stream of consciousness kind of narration where uh, what was going on Stephen's psyche is described and that is alternated here by uh, this uh, realistic style of description of the Jewish quarters. Uh, what is the point of this uh, description? Once again, uh, the point is to uh, established to the reader that now Stephen has become a regular visitor to the Jewish quarters, to the prostitutes quarters. Uh, this has become his habit. Therefore, in this chapter, we see a new kind of crisis uh, growing, uh, where Stephen becomes more and more uh, addicted towards uh, this, uh, these uh, sexual experiences. And uh, these experiences will uh, lead to the uh, guilt or the awareness of sin in him and uh, therefore uh, his, uh, he, his mind is overwhelmed uh, in this chapter by this awareness of sin and we will see that the spiritual uh, crisis for Stephen here is a further uh, exas exacerbated or we may say further increased uh, by the sermon by a priest uh, during the retreat. Uh, not one sermon, uh, four sermons are there. <clears throat> Therefore, at the end of this chapter, another new kind of resolution would be needed. Uh, which will offer offer him some uh, respite from this overwhelming burden of guilt and sinfulness. And that resolution will come through uh, Stephen's confession uh, to a priest. The In the first paragraph we see the word dull is repeated. Uh, dull day, dull square, again uh, this word is repeated uh, then on the next page, the dull light fell more faintly upon the page where on another equation began to unfold itself slowly and to spread abroad its widening tail. So why is this word dull repeated so many times? Uh, one would think that uh, it is a stylistic fault if a particular word is repeated too many times. But then in Joyce's case, Joyce was a consummate artist with words. He uh, therefore uses this word repeatedly uh, with a particular motive. And his motive is to, uh, to convey the idea that sexual promiscuity leads to dullness of the senses and also religion. So both sexual promiscuity and religion for Stephen, they lead to a dullness uh, of the senses. Then we read, a cold lucid indifference reigned in his soul. So this is the result of this dullness, you know, this uh, overuse or uh, too much experience of the sense, senses, the uh, sensual gratification. That leads to this kind of cold, lucid indifference. Indifference to what? Very significant word. Indifference to the sense of uh, good and evil, uh, sinfulness perhaps. A certain pride, a certain awe withheld him from offering to God even one prayer at night, though he knew it was in God's power to take away his life while he slept and hurl his soul hellward ere he could beg for mercy. His pride in his own sin, 
His loveless awe of God told him that his offense was too grievous to be atoned for in whole or in part by a false homage to the all-seeing and all-knowing. So on the one hand, Stephen has an acute sense of the greatness of God because he is a believer uh, at this moment. And he uh, believes that God can overpower him or just uh, make him die at any moment or punish him in any way. On the one hand, he has this uh, recognition uh, of God's power. On the other hand, uh, he is proud of his rebellion, so to say, against the norms of society and against religion by overindulging in the uh, senses or the sexual activities. So, because of his very uh, strict Roman Catholic education and training, uh, he, in him we find there is an opposite urge, an urge to destroy all these ideals and uh, to do something just opposed to what he was taught. So this act of rebellion is also a process of growth. Adolescents would often rebel against uh, the dictates of the elders. Uh, they would often violently protest against their parents or their teachers or their peers and they would love to go their own ways. So this revolution, uh, this uh, rebellion is a part of the process of growth. But uh, he recognizes that he was proud of his uh, activities and uh, therefore uh, that is a you know, cardinal sin uh, from his Christian training he knew very well that pride was the cardinal sin. On Sunday mornings as he passed the church door he glanced coldly as the worshippers who stood bareheaded four deep outside the church morally presented the mass which they could neither see nor hear. Their dull piety and the sickly smell of the cheap hair oil with which they had anointed their heads repelled him from the altar they prayed at. He stooped to the evil of hypocrisy with others, skeptical of their innocence which he could catch also easily. So uh, he was repelled at the uh, exhibition of piety by the church goers on Sundays and he was also repelled by the uncouth smell of the hair oil. So that, that hurts his uh, aesthetic experience, aesthetic sensibility. The, um, now he uh, gains, ironically, when he was uh, committing more, more and more, you know, uh, so to say, sinful activities. At the same time, he was being looked upon in his uh, school as an ideal uh, boy uh, who was devoted to religion. So he got a position given by the Jesuit fathers. He was elected the prefect of the sodality. On the wall of his bedroom hung an illuminated scroll, the certificate of his prefecture in the college of the sodality of the blessed Virgin Mary. On Saturday mornings when the sodality met in the chapel to recite the little office, his place was a cushion kneeling back at the right of the altar from which he led his wing of boys through the responses. Uh, the little office uh, was a book of Latin instructions uh, about how to conduct the mass and uh, Stephen had the responsibility of reading from this book, the little office. When it fell to him to read the lesson toward the close of the office, he read it in a veiled voice lulling his con con conscience to its music. And here is a Latin quotation from the little office. Uh, and in this quotation we find uh, uh, allusion to uh, various uh, perfumes and saints and uh, so on. Because here we see the reference to Cedar trees in Lebanon and uh, in, in uh, and the uh, palm trees 
the uh, plantation of rose in Jericho, the uh, reference to uh, cinnamon and balsam and other aromatic, uh, you know, things, and their odor, their their aroma. <coughs> This is uh, from the third lesson uh, from Little Office. So even in this uh, Latin quotation, we have a reference to rose, uh, roses. So we know that uh, the rose imagery is very important in this novel. And uh, the rose imagery crops up whenever there is an indication of a growth in Stephen's psyche. So here Stephen is conscious of his sin. His sin which had covered him from the sight of God had led him nearer to the refuge of sinners. Her eyes seemed to regard him with mild pity. Her holiness, a strange light glowing faintly upon her frail flesh, did not humiliate the sinner who approached her. That is, Stephen is thinking of Virgin Mary. The rector announces that there will be a retreat. So uh, those of you who uh, studied in uh, Roman Catholic institutions, you know uh, what a retreat is. And uh, the rector also uh, defines uh, the retreat. And uh, during the retreat, the uh, students, teachers, staff, everybody is uh, supposed to withdraw from their usual work and uh, to focus on uh, the uh, sermons uh, which would be uh, delivered and to they would focus on their own spiritual progress. So the director defines it, the retreat will begin on Wednesday afternoon in honor of St. Francis Xavier whose feast day is Saturday. The retreat will go on from Wednesday to Friday. Then we have the sermons one after another and uh, the sermons are on the four last things. So according to Roman Catholic Catechism, uh, the four last things are death, judgment, hell and heaven. Now here, in this sermon, in the first sermon, <coughs> the father defines a retreat. A retreat, my dear boys, signifies a withdrawal for a while from the cares of our life, the cares of this workaday world, in order to examine the state of our conscience, to reflect on the mysteries of holy religion, and to understand better why we are here in this world. During these few days I intend to put before you some thoughts concerning the four last things. They are, as you know from your catechism, death, judgment, hell and heaven. And then uh, there are some 18 pages of sermons, which is unbelievable uh, in any work of literature, uh, because the sermons are only speeches and there is no action. So imagine that for 18 pages there is no action and only speeches or sermons. So you may say that it was a novel exper experiment by Joyce, uh, whether this could be uh, incorporated in an art form or not. And uh, it actually fits in, uh, in the scheme of this novel very well, because the novel is a, is a novel of the mind. And since the effect of the sermons is on the mind, particularly here on Stephen's mind. Therefore, uh, in a way, they paradoxically, they, they uh, represent progress in action. But this action is not physical action, but mental action or action in the mind. Uh, the purpose of the novelist here is to depict how or what effect the sermons would have on Stephen's psyche. And they have a very disastrous effect on him uh, because we know that uh, Stephen was extremely sensitive uh, to ideas, words and uh, therefore 
on a sensitive mind the sermons which uh, are rhetorically constructed and the very purpose of which was to have an impact on the minds uh, that they will have a very strong effect on uh, Stephen's mind and therefore we will see that at the end of the novel he feels like uh, uh, his, uh, the balloon of his pride has been pricked and uh, he uh, is worthless and he loses all self-esteem and tries to find some kind of solution uh, to this spiritual crisis and therefore he goes to the priest to confess but before that uh, we see that the uh, second sermon or the, the uh, sermons on the next day were about death and judgment the next day brought death and judgment this is the first sermon stirring his soul slowly from its listless despair the faint glimmer of fear became a terror of spirit as the hoarse voice of the preacher blew death into his soul he suffered in agony he felt the death chill touch the extremities and creep onward towards the heart the films of death veiling the eyes the bright centers of the brain extinguished one by one like lamps the last sweat oozing upon the skin the powerlessness of the dying limbs the speech thickening and wandering and failing the heart throbbing faintly and more faintly all but vanquished the breath the poor breath the poor helpless human spirit sobbing and sighing gurgling and rattling in the throat no help and so on uh, so this is we see the impact of the sermon on Stephen uh, the uh, sermon is about death and judgment and uh, these sermons uh, which uh, were designed to uh, make people afraid from committing sin uh, by uh, talking about the punishment in hell that their souls might suffer uh, these ser sermons are called uh, hellfire sermons the preacher draws images from the book of revelation in the bible nor was that all god's justice had still to be vindicated before men after the particular there still remained the general judgment the last day had come so you know that in the book of revelation there is uh, an apocalyptic image of the uh, doomsday the end of the world uh, when it will, it will also be the day of judgment and all souls will be resurrected and all souls will be called uh, before God's throne for judgment. Uh, this is uh, described in the book of Revelation and uh, here Joyce closely follows the book of Revelation. The last day had come, doomsday day was at hand. The stars of heaven were falling upon the earth like the figs cast by the fig tree which the wind has shaken. The sun, the great luminary of the universe, had become uh, as sackcloth of hair. The moon was blood red. The firmament was as a scroll rolled away. The archangel Michael, the prince of the heavenly host, appeared glorious and terrible against the sky. With one foot on the sea and one foot on the land, he blew from the archangelical trumpet the brazen death of time, uh, and so on. So uh, the purpose of this uh, description uh, in the book of Revelation is to rouse fear in the minds of the uh, sinners, of people, uh, about God's judgment. And uh, here we have a quotation from the Gospel of St. Matthew, uh, where God tells the sinners uh, to depart he calls the just to his side, bidding them enter into the kingdom, the eternity of bliss prepared for them. The unjust he casts from him, crying in his offended majesty, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. So this sentence from the Gospel of St. Matthew is repeated in this sermon again and again. Uh, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire. Uh, and uh, thus, 
it raises the fear of death and the fear of damnation. The Son of God cometh at an hour when you little expect Him. Be therefore ready every moment, seeing that you may die at any moment. Death is at the end of us. Death is the end of us all. Death and judgment brought into the world by the sin of our first parents, the dark portals that close our earthly existence, and so on. And then uh, there is a quotation from uh, Saint Paul, the first book of Corinthians. O grave, where is the victory? O death, where is the sting? Uh, it is uh, actually. Uh, it does not follow the exact text. The actual text is, where is the victory or death? Where is the sting or hell? So this uh, quotation from the book of, uh, from the letter to Corinthians by Saint Paul, uh, number one, uh, is very significant here because this expresses the uh, way death or uh, hell can be vanquished by a noble soul uh, who uh, follows God's path. So death or hell will have no power over such a soul. And Stephen is extremely influenced uh, by these words. Every word of it was for him, against his sin, foul and secret. The whole wrath of God was aimed. The preacher's knife had probed deeply the preacher's knife had probed deeply into his diseased conscience and he felt how that his soul was festering in sin. Yes, the preacher was right. God's turn had come. Like a beast in its lair, his soul had lain down in its own filth. But the blasts of the angel's trumpet had driven him forth from the darkness of sin into the light. The words of doom cried by the angel shattered in an instant his presumptuous peace. The wind of the last day blew through his mind. His sins, the jewel-eyed harlots of his imagination, fled before the hurricane, squeaking like mice in their terror and huddled under the mane of hair. So Stephen uh, felt uh, that his sins were all uh, coming to light, the dark secrets of his soul, and they were uh, leaving him in fear of uh, judgment and he felt the uh, impact of the doomsday or the day of judgment. So here Stephen is feeling uh, uh, weak uh, and this feeling uh, before religion, this surrender before religion is like uh, the feeling of castration as uh, the modern psychologists tell us, like as Lacan would say, that uh, before the law of the father, uh, the male child feels uh, that he is castrated, that he becomes powerless. When the agony of shame had passed from him, he tried to raise his soul from its abject powerlessness. God and the blessed virgin were too far from him. God was too great and stern, and the blessed virgin too pure and holy. But he imagined that he stood near Emma in a wide land and humbly and in tears bent and kissed the elbow of her sleeve. So you see when Stephen is thinking about uh, Virgin Mary and that she is too pure and holy for him, then he also thinks about Emma. So the images of Virgin Mary and Emma Clary uh, tend to blend in his psyche as one. And he feels that as if uh, the uh, Virgin Mary tells them uh, to join their hands. Take hands, Stephen and Emma. It is a beautiful evening now in heaven. You have heard, but you are always my children. It is one heart that love another heart. Take hands together, my dear children, and you will be happy together, and your hearts will love each other. Rain was falling on the chapel. So after the first sermon ends, rain was falling on the chapel, on the garden, on the college, it would rain forever noiselessly. The water would rise inch by inch, covering the grass and shrubs, covering the trees and houses, covering the monuments and the mountain tops. Uh, here we have 
uh, representation of uh, Noah's flood in the Bible. That is when uh, the world would be full of sin, then there would be a flood to wash away the sins. There will be a catastrophic flood. So the image of the rain here is imagined as causing such a flood. All life would be ch choked off noiselessly. Birds, men, elephants, pigs, children, noiselessly floating corpses amid the litter of the wreckage of the world. Forty days and forty nights the rain would fall till the waters covered the face of the earth. Okay. So uh, in a way uh, the image of water according to Jung is also uh, the mother archetype. So, uh, the mother archetype is an image uh, of rescue and redressal. So, when Stephen feels that he is drowned in sin, then the water image comes as an archetype which would signify some way out of this situation. All right. So, I will stop here. If you have any questions, you can ask. Sir? Yes. Sir, rose imagery to repeat for one, please. The rose imagery is uh, throughout the novel, right? At the beginning, the uh, it, it stands for, uh, it, it always appears at moments uh, when we can perceive a growth in Stephen's psyche. Uh, because this novel is a novel of growth, uh, that is particularly growth of the mind. Uh, so whenever uh, Stephen's uh, mind uh, becomes one degree mature, a little mature by some experience, then we see the rose image. Okay. Uh, and the novel has, uh, uh, at the beginning we had in school, uh, in uh, Clongoeswood College, Stephen uh, saw the class divided into two groups, uh, white rose and red rose. And then Stephen uh, imagined that there, whether there could be a green rose. Uh, in nature there is no green rose. So uh, that stood for uh, Stephen's power of imagination because he would be a creative artist. He thought that he would be a creative artist. And towards the end of the novel, uh, there is this uh, allusion to the uh, divine white rose uh, of light, uh, which is taken from Dante's Divine Comedy, which stands for the beatific vision of God in heaven. Uh, so that is the culmination of the rose image, which uh, suggests that uh, Stephen had uh, his uh, psyche fully developed and matured and uh, he could go beyond uh, the immediate experiences and has uh, traversed a, a, a long way to uh, come to some kind of maturity. Is it clear? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Any other question?